right guys what is up swim here and this is my underlords duos guide so duos is a new mode in underlords where you can team up with a friend uh in a two-person tag team and play against seven other teams in a 16-player lobby to try to win it's actually a ton of fun this is a guide i'm not trying to sell you on duos but but i will say real quick it's an amazingly fun mode find a friend play duos I have been jamming Doze nonstop, and I don't plan on going back to solos anytime soon. So, the actual guide, let's talk about, uh, for a few minutes, the basics of Duos. We're just going to explain the rules and how it even works. And then after that, for the rest of the video, we're going to talk about some uh, somewhat basic strategies and then somewhat more advanced strategies. You're definitely going to learn some things from this video, um, even if you don't even play a lot of Duos, because I'm going to be talking about some broad strategy in general. Throughout this video, I'll be showing off gameplay footage of myself playing in a duos tournament, uh, and we'll even use a couple of examples from that as well. So without further ado, the basics of duos. What is duos? Well, the first thing to understand is that you and your partner will share the same exact XP bar as well as the same health bar, but you won't share gold. Gold will need to be transferred between each of you manually by using this button here uh, on the black bar in the shop to send the other person gold or by sending them units and having them sell them. How the HP is going to be handled from fights is it will calculate the net HP lost or won, basically, uh, and effectively distribute uh, the loser the loser team a little bit of damage. So as a broad example of that, uh, let's say I beat my opponent's board by five points, but my teammate loses against his opponent's board, you know, uh, my opponent's teammate, by seven points. That will net be a two-point loss, uh, five minus seven, and our team will lose two health. Our health will be, go down by two, and it's counted as an effective loss. We will both gain the free reroll mechanic you get on a loss, and uh, we will not gain one gold for winning. It, and it would be one gold each if we had one. This will also count as a lose for streaking purposes. You streak as a team. You and your teammate can freely trade heroes between each other, as long as your benches aren't full, um, by dragging your units to the lower left next to the shop where there's a special send to teammate button. In addition to that, the shop will have a very handy black bar on it um, under your normal shop, and this is going to show you the hero progress on your opponent's bench under every hero in the shop. This is incredibly useful and you should spend most of the time shopping, making sure you are looking at this black bar. Naturally, because you and your teammate are sharing the same XP bar, you will cumulatively gain a total of two XP per round instead of the normal one XP in single player mode. Additionally, however, it will cost more XP for each level up. And lastly, while you and your teammate have the ability to freely exchange any gold or heroes, you cannot exchange items or underlords. This is really important and will lead to some strategies we will actually talk about later on. All right, now that we understand the actual rules of Duo, let's, before we get into the strategy, let's talk about what sort of gameplay or meta difference you're going to uh, encounter here. Well, the first thing to note is because all golds and heroes are interchangeable, stacking gold on one person doesn't really become a strategy. You're not gonna see so much the idea of a carry and support relationship like you would in Dota. Oftentimes you'll have one board that's stronger than the other just naturally, but you're not trying to intentionally weaken one board so that the other gets uh, better because of course all interest points are distributed and shared equally. In general, it's probably a good idea to, when in doubt, try to have uh, an even amount of gold uh, across both players on your team. Now, the main thing to understand about duos mode compared to single player in Underlords is that timings for almost everything are way, way different. In terms of what you would expect for something like three star progress, you are going to be seeing three stars before round 10 fairly commonly, uh, before round 15 in almost every game. And that's something that's gonna be a little different coming from single player mode, right? So the timings of what your three star progresses have to be for you to continue on that, you know, on that approach trying to three star unit are gonna be very different. The timings at which you'll level are gonna be very different. And the timings at which certain players are dropping out of the game is also gonna be very different. 
there's often going to be players exiting the game uh, before round 20, which in normal gameplay would be pretty insane. But because if both boards lose, you will get smacked for sometimes upwards of 30, upwards of 40 damage sometimes, you will be, uh, if you have both weak boards, dropping out a lot earlier. So it's very, very important to play very defensively of your health as you approach these levels that are normally kind of like mid-game rounds, you know, uh, round 15, round 20, these are normally like early and mid-game. And now round 20 becomes kind of like the new 25 or even new 30, depending on your health amount. Because games typically will play at a faster pace uh, due to this, you're often not going to be playing for the full double 50 gold interest or 100 gold interest as uh, long as you probably would in something like a single player mode if you had that ability. Uh, oftentimes you're going to be dipping through your interest, you know, even a little bit to level up when you're leveling around around 16 and definitely on 21. Talking about those levels, the level timing here is often going to be uh, level 5 on round 9, although uh, you can level to 6 on round 9 if you have a streak that's worth protecting. Uh, level 6 or 7 on round 16, and I think in general 8 on 21 has got to be where you're going for in a normal build. Now obviously there's a lot of situations that will deviate from this. Sometimes you can get away with being 7 on 21, but oftentimes it's going to be kind of more punishing, especially against higher level players where you will have to level faster. You can go to level 9 anytime between rounds 26 and 31, but you'll often find you're not going to be going to level 10 in duos modes, except in pretty rare circumstances, just because it's very expensive and the pressure from early on will hurt your ability to save up that much gold. Now, I mentioned earlier that 3-starring is a much more abundant strategy, and this is clear in the timings that you'll be willing to chase three stars. When in doubt, three star everything. I think an important thing to understand in, you know, solo gameplay is knowing when to not three star. You know, if you have a fourth unit coming in on like round 16, depending on your health amount, depending on how value of a three star that is, it's often proper to decline the opportunity to play for it for an interest point, right? Having a four of, you know, you need nine units to fully complete the three star, you're pretty far away. Uh, and some heroes like Pudge and Witch Doctor um, that are very commonly you have the opportunity to build like fourth, fifth, sixth versions of them. Um, in solos, I often won't be doing that. In duos, I absolutely will be. You're basically three starring everything with the exception of, you know, past round 20. It's hard to play for something that's a four of, or depending on your health, possibly a five of, right? To be able to get all that progress up the way to nine. Additionally, new one-shot range, as mentioned, you know, you'll be taking a lot more damage. So new one-shot range, when it was something like 15 health before 15 to 20, it's now closer to 25 to 30. Again, you can get slapped for 40. You should start spending your gold very aggressively. If you have 20 health left, you and your teammate should probably, when in doubt, not always, but probably have zero gold each. Spend it down. Don't be greedy. Now, because you're three-starring so many units, items will often become very imbalanced in terms of how they normally are. Uh, particularly items that scale with unit levels, those are going to be items like chainmail or gloves to list the tier 1 items, but anything that gives high armor or attack speed uh, is going to do extremely well. Mask of Madness and Moonshard are late tier examples. Uh, whereas items that just give you health, damage, or mana tend to be weaker in comparison, although Daedalus can still win out even though it is a plus damage item. Okay, so now we covered the basic rules of the game and we covered some of the implications on how the speed of the game is just gonna be different from single player. Let's actually talk about some of the strategy that's gonna get you a leg up on the competition. So rule number one, avoid building the same unit as your teammate. That's pretty obvious to a lot of people. That's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, for example, if one of you is on six knights and one of you is on six elusives, you're probably going to be fighting over Luna unless the jail is extremely favorable for you on that particular day. And that's typically a no-no. Uh, it's definitely important to think ahead and plan ahead and make sure you're not picking two different compositions that are both going to fight very hard over a single unit. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that 
not every composition, not, not, not every pair of compositions is going to have that problem. As an example, maybe one person can be on Brawny and one person can be on a Hunter. Well, they both kind of want Beastmaster, but Brawny, of course, needs Beastmaster, whereas Hunter has a lot of options. There's nine Hunters currently in the game right now, and at most, you know, usually one of them is going to end up being jailed, so it's not as if you can't play six Hunters quite easily without Beastmaster and let your Brawny partner use it. Okay, tip number two. I'm going to start out kind of more basic with these and get into more and more advanced. Number two, communication is super, super important. You and your teammate, if you want to play effectively, and especially if you want to have fun, because it's a lot more fun, you know, being in voice with your teammate or in the same room, if that's what you're into, um, you want to be talking with each other often constantly, right? Like, for example, when I'm playing in this tournament, me and my partner are just literally yelling at each other the entire time. Uh, and often, speed and timings of things is going to be very, very important, so communication needs to be very streamlined. Uh, so great examples of where you and your teammate should communicate are even like round one. If you're in round one and you're looking at your round one pack, you often just it's kind of the big thing that sends you in a direction, so it's customary for both uh, players to call their full round one packs and decide who should lock, or both should lock, or neither should lock. Um, oftentimes, if there's no lock, you'll both kind of try to pick the same unit so that you at least end up with a pair, and then one of the players will get that pair later. Uh, locking is very common round one in duos, uh, oftentimes just because, you know, you know what the other person wants, and you can see what they have, so it's kind of easier to make combos in that way. Another really big aspect of communication is on level and role decisions. Uh, and there's a lot to talk about. I'm actually going to cover that a bit more later in the video. But uh, the timing at which you're going to level and roll is going to be determined by effectively the role value of both players. Okay, so you're definitely going to have to communicate a lot in terms of, you know, deciding, hey, should we level here? Hey, should we roll here? Hey, what are we going to do in the next few rounds? When's our next power spike? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, on top of all this, the number one thing you're going to spend most of your time doing with your partner is making sure you're hitting interest points effectively. So step number one, at the start of every single round, you do want to make sure that you have the ability to hit an interest point. Uh, otherwise, you shouldn't be buying units that aren't going to be improving the round you're currently on, right? You want to be hitting interest points often and aggressively. It's really, really important, especially in duos. And if you can like streamline your interest point gameplay uh, with your partner for the first 15 rounds, you are going to be a much better player because of it. Your games are going to end up much, much better. So obviously, uh, when one of you is at, you know, four gold and one of you is at six gold, you have the interest point because one of you will give uh, the full gold to the other person. That person will have 10 golds total and they'll get that one interest point. So you have to pass gold back and forth, make sure you were hitting interest points as effectively as possible. And every new shop, always ask yourselves, can I hit a new interest point? Talk about what we can sell to maybe hit an interest point, how close we are, can we hit next interest point? Uh, and it just ends up mattering so much for the entire game. And lastly, you want to be calling every shop round with your partner for the first 15 rounds or so of the game. The first 15 rounds are very important. These are the interest rounds. These are where you're kind of deciding what path you want to go. And on top of all that, you're also deciding uh, which two stars you might just add to your board randomly. So, you know, maybe you calling, uh, maybe you have a pack that has two assassins in it. Your partner has a pack that has two assassins in it. They don't really know what to go. And if you both call it, you know, maybe you're Around, around six or whatever, they'll be like, oh, wow, we both have good assassins on the same turn. Maybe I'll go assassin since you already know what you're going. You know, that's not a bad idea. Uh, and I think that's very, very important because choosing the best composition in the early game is probably the single most important decision in any Dota Underlords game, right? Uh, in addition to that, you know, any two stars will hit your board hard pre-10. So, I mean, even just calling something that might not normally be a big deal. You know, if I roll like two shadow, if I roll any weak pair, any weak pair at all, like two razor, two shadow shaman, maybe even shadow demon who isn't terribly weak, but any weak pair, I'll call to my shop. And if my partner, you know, has a singleton of that in their shop, then we can slap that two star on somebody's board and that's going to improve somebody. Okay, let's get into tip number three. Tip number three, not super advanced, but we're getting into some at least slightly more uh, intricate stuff. Now, it's very, very important to be benching your partner's ace tier odds. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, the way ace tier odds work is if you as a player in single player or in duos, if you as a player have between your board and your bench, if you own personally 
at least one tier of an ace alliance, not every alliance has an ace, but one of the nine alliances with the ace of that alliance, it has to be the ace of that alliance, then you get a 15% flat chance of finding that ace hero if you have an ace role in the shop. Now, I know that all sounded extremely confusing, Basically, I'm going to make this very simple. Let's say you are benching or have between combination of bench and board at least one tier of whatever ace you want. Let's say Troll Warlord is the unit you want. So as long as you have between board and bench any combination of Shadow Shaman, uh, Witch Doctor, Dazzle, or Batrider, any two of those, you will have a 15% flat rate. Now that flat rate is really important. Because what this means is your odds of finding that Troll Warlord will go up between uh, two and three times. Well, two between two and three times. So the math is a little bit more complicated, but all you need to know is your odds of finding the ace you're looking for when you are playing for these ace odds will double or triple something in that range. That's a big deal. I think that's probably a bigger deal than most people will immediately think ace odds are. Um, so... If my partner is going Assassins and I'm going Knights, then it's very important that he's benching at least two Knights so that he gets Ace Odds for the Knights, Sven, the Ace of Knights, if it's not Jailed. And it's important that I'm benching at least three Assassins, because Knights is a two of Alliance and Assassin is a three of. I need to be benching at least three Assassins so that I have the ability to find Faceless Void his ace. And of course, because I have knights on my board, I have Sven odds, and he has assassins on his board, he has void odds, it means uh, the benches and boards should sort of be inverted. Now one thing this will often lead to is you and your partner basically swapping benches. Uh, so my knights, you know, let's say I've got seven Chaos Knights, so I've got like, you know, a tier two Chaos Knight on my bench, like a level two Chaos Knight and a level one Chaos Knight on my bench. I'll give him one of my Chaos Knights. I'll give him like an Omni. Maybe I've got fourth Omni or something, you know, my level two is in play and my three star progress on my bench, he's keeping on his to give him Sven odds. And I'm keeping his three star progress on my bench. You don't have to worry about this until you're level eight. So past round 21. But I can't stress enough, it's actually very important if you do want to, you know, uh, increase your win rate, those ace tier odds going up is a very, very big deal. You're also definitely going to want to be aware of when, you know, your partner might be looking for something that isn't so necessarily explicit um, with their alliance, right? Sometimes they might want an ace that isn't in their alliance. I know there's some players, for example, that like running Faceless Void. Uh, outside of assassins, maybe you're a primordial partner, you might want to bench three assassins just so your primordial partner can run Faceless Void. Tip number four. This is one of my favorites. Be prepared to swap boards with your partner. I actually kind of love this when it happens. I think it's kind of funny. It's very high skill. It forces you to play diverse. Now, what I mean is something I referenced earlier. You can't swap items with your partner. In fact, items are one of the two things you can't swap, the other being the Underlord you choose. So, let's say one person is going knights and the other person is going mages. Uh, now, I would actually say this is often a bad idea because both players are often going to be fighting over Dragon Knight, if you remember my rule above, because mages really want Dragon Knight for fourth human and to link dragons with Puck. But let's just say, okay, knights and mages, and the mage player finds a Mask of Madness, right? And the knight player has great, you know, progress on maybe their Luna. It, maybe it's three star already, let's just say. Or maybe it's not even there yet. And suddenly... The only thing you can do to get that Mask of Madness on the high impact unit in Knights is to entirely swap compositions with your teammate. I think personally that this is, it's pretty funny when it happens and you'll feel like a pro when you pull it off. I did it like a couple of times in the tournament and it actually was able to work pretty well. Sometimes this can be kind of a late game swap, sometimes very early, but it often will more so come down to your items than your Underlord, at least until we kind of have more of a meta established about which Underlords will want to be in which comps. 
So, uh, oftentimes the items that you're going to want to be swapping around are the very situational items that might be kind of nuts in some comps and maybe weaker in others. Uh, great examples of those are Mask of Madness, Blade Mail, Target Buddy, Octarine Core, Moonshard, and most mana items. Uh, mana items obviously are pretty trash on certain comps, but very key in something like mages. Blade Mail being great on kind of defensive comps, any comp with a built in resistance or evasion, because Blade Mail reflects before any sort of armor, any sort of damage reduction, even before evasion. Mask of Madness, of course, being extremely important on three star carries that have passives, uh, ideally to be able to not be silenced by the Mask of Madness. And uh, Octarine just being on, you know, one of many heroes in the game. Pretty much any like big three star, although some of the best candidates are something like Trium Protector, something like uh, Bristleback right now, Beastmaster three stars, the big three stars with the big abilities. Uh, one example in a game I was actually playing earlier today uh, was my partner had a Tusk level 2 and two other warriors right off the gate, right off round 4, uh, and I found a blade mail in my shop. Uh, we immediately switched boards so I could put the blade mail on the kind of warrior early game board, and it actually was a big deal. This swap allowed us to win streak in a situation we would have lost several boards in a row, because just being a little bit more efficient with your board is, in Underlords, gonna go a long way. Okay, tip number five. This is probably the most advanced tip. This is the one that it's gonna be harder to pull off than a full board swap and doing that super effectively. But this is going to help a lot of intermediate or even advanced players take their game to the next level. This is actually not even a duos exclusive tip, but it's more relevant in duos due to the higher priority of three starring units. Specifically, this tip is look at jail tier bans. Now, it's a really important mechanic to understand. In Underlords, you have your daily jail, and the jail is the units you aren't going to be seeing in any shops for that day. Now, how shops in Underlords work is they'll generate the tier before they generate the unit, which means, you know, when you've got tier rods, uh, you will be finding any unit available in that tier. So, the important thing to understand is when you have, let's say, three different tier threes being banned out, uh, out of the 17 currently available tier threes otherwise, going down to 14 options, the odds of hitting those remaining 14 tier threes goes up. In fact, it goes up by a much more significant amount uh, than most people would immediately think. Uh, it depends a little bit on the situation, but basically, long story short, it will overall increase the speed at which you are able to hit three stars um, of those units, if it's three units being banned out, by about 25%. That is crazy. That's a really, really, really big deal. Uh, so, for example, I mean, and any three star you're hitting, like Luna, CK, Beastmaster, Tinker, whatever, depending on the tier that's banned out, any three star you're hitting, you're going to be hitting sometimes about five rounds earlier on average, right? Again, huge deal. The difference between hitting a three star on like round 25 and hitting a three star on like round 30 is pretty gigantic, right? So let's talk about, you know, why this is relevant for duos because you're three starring so many things. So look at the daily jail and maybe think about which comps get better the more twos and three stars get banned out. So Knights and Elusives are two alliances that do often run a lot of uh, two stars, uh, in particular Knights DPS units, Chaos Knight and Luna, and usually the DPS units are the kind of most important ones to level up. Knights DPS units are two stars, uh, and Elusives have a lot of two star DPS options as well. So Knights and Elusives are a bit better with more tier twos banned out. Maybe you've got a day with like four tier twos banned out and only one tier three unit banned out. Suddenly, maybe you're thinking about running knights over something else. Depending on your opener, of course, don't go too far out of your way. Then, alternatively, if you have a day that has more tier 3s banned out of JL, assassins, hunters, and scrappies are maybe going to be your better option. 
or if there's a day with not a lot of units in those tiers banned out, um, maybe like one tier two and one tier three, maybe going for a level up build instead, something like warriors or, you know, the classic, yeah, classic good stuff warriors or mages could actually be a bit favorable. So think about these jail bans. Again, this is not just for duos mode, although it will apply more for duos mode. Uh, and be, be aware that the jail is a bit more than what it appears in terms of what gets strong and what gets weak. I'm gonna link in the description a spreadsheet that I've been working on for some time as a pet project. This has tons of useful info for a lot of newer or even intermediate or even advanced players. Uh, one page of the spreadsheet is actually just talking about the daily jail system. This is unrelated to duos, but just thought I'd mention it and it's gonna be a helpful resource to a lot of you guys if you check it out. Okay, final bonus tip friends and family discount this is actually pretty funny uh one of course one player gets friends and family discount they have cheaper units in their shop and the other player does not so the player with friends and family discount is going to want to be the one that presses roll the entire rest of the game so after one player gets friends and family discount ideally you would consolidate the consolidate all the gold remaining on that player, um, and effectively they would just spend all the gold rolling instead of both players kind of rolling at the same time. It ends up being a lot more efficient, and every little bit of gold you squeeze out in Underlords is going to go a really long way. Alright guys, that's going to be it for me. Hopefully you learned a trick or two that's going to help you take your duos game to the next level and make you feel a little bit more comfortable about potentially not embarrassing yourself in front of any given teammate. You can also link this video to a friend if you are good at Underlords and they are not and you want to maybe help make them into a better duos partner but don't want to take the time or effort to do it yourself. Just make me do it. That works too. Whatever floats your boat. I'm going to go uh, say goodnight to my cat. And I guess that's it. We'll see you guys next time.